Chapter Seven, Broached. They pulled another all-nighter, still concealed by the pre-dawn sky, with Hiccup adamant about making it to the southeastern coast of Wessex by first light. He wanted a full day's rest before daring to cross the English Channel. He was far more worried about it than Toothless, who found Hiccup's concern more insulting than anything else. So, how old are you? Hiccup asked. The questions he'd come up with so far were harmless and hardly personal, like he wanted to solidify his understanding of Toothless from the ground up. Old? Hiccup encountered this communication issue before, where dragons had different phrases or methods of keeping track of things humans found important. How many winters have you seen? He tried. A moment of silence passed before Toothless realized Hiccup was trying to measure his time spent since his hatching. I cannot truly say. For most of my life I have been with my drove, and we do not measure time by your seasons. Wait! Hiccup interrupted. There are other night furies? Uh, ah, of course there are if you exist. I mean, you can't have been the only one. Sorry, sorry I sound really stupid, I know. But you always seem to be the only one that attacked the village. I guess we, we sort of built you up into some kind of singular icon. Hmm. Not that I mind. It is nice to be shown appropriate reverence. Hiccup snorted, and then coughed, having accidentally inhaled a cloud that were passing through. There were some topics the pair hadn't gotten around to breaching, such as the war. It would come in time. Hiccup couldn't avoid discussing Burke forever, but Toothless found it refreshing to see Hiccup talking about the war so casually, as though they were untouched by their pasts. His human seemed more concerned with the concept of his drove. It is because I was the only one of my kind in the region. Toothless paused, wondering where to start. Let me tell you something about my drove. Tad Kikivak, Night Furies, as you humans have named us, are a clan of n nomads. We are periodic nomads. We have two... moments? Seasons. We have two seasons, like your winters and your summers. We refer to them as spells, the resting and the roving. Much of our time is spent in a land at the peak of the world, when the sun does not appear for many, many moon patterns. That is our resting spell. When the sun rises, we follow the moon until the time of no sun returns. That is our roving spell. My kind is apt to avoiding the light at all costs. It was not until I became separated from my drove that I learned to live under its heat. Wow, Hiccup uttered. Every other word failed him for the moment. It had only been a day or so since the dream vision, and Hiccup felt he would never overcome the awe of having such a spring of knowledge available to him. The voice he heard, deep, faltering, youthful, the words he exchanged with the dragon, were his only proof that Gudrid, that the dream, was real. The wind slapping his face told him he wasn't dreaming now. So, you're migratory with the night time. Uh, were, I guess. Your seasons are different. Not in years like we count. You have no way to tell how long you've been alive? Coloring will mark where a dragon stands in life. For my kind, hatchlings are blue and very bright, even when just under starlight. Fully mature adults are absent of all color. Black, Hiccup supplied. Yes, black. The longest we spend in our life is black. It made sense to Hiccup. Humans, too, spent the majority of their life considered as mature adults. When we begin to reach the extent of our time in this world, the black will fade. Those who live with faded scales are held in the highest regard. Human hair goes grey when they get old, Hiccup supplied aloud. He sensed grey was the color Toothless referred to when he spoke of fading. The elder in our village is considered the wisest, and she is completely grey. Is human hair a good indicator of age? In most cases, Hiccup conceded. We don't start out with much when we're born, and it keeps on growing from there. Then again, some people lose their hair before they lose their color. He recalled Gover's hair receding so fast that the man started to shave his whole head. Hiccup looked down at Toothless' scales. It was still dark out. The sun had not yet begun to rise, but he didn't need light to know there still shined with the blue tint. Did this mean Toothless was still young? The thought pleased Hiccup. He felt more connected with his best friend, as neither were fully mature adults yet. In other ways, it left them worlds apart. Something told Hiccup that he'd die long, long before Toothless. 
How many winters have you seen? Toothless's question startled him out of his funk. This will be my sixteenth, Hiccup said, sounding distracted. Come Thori, he would have been considered a legal adult back in Burke. He would have the right to speak at the Long Ting and lead his own hunts. Not that those rights would have been easily exercised with his reputation. That is not much, is it? Toothless sounded as though he had tuned into Hiccup's earlier train of thought. Hiccup shook his head, the cool wind treading through his hair like ghostly fingers, and he ran his hand down the scales on Toothless's neck. Blue-black, still young. I think, compared to you, it's not. Since my separation from the drove, I have stayed more than sixteen winters. There was a different... chief? Yes, a different chief than your father. Hiccup bit his lip. So you could be older than my dad. And my time around your islands was not much compared to my time with my drove, Toothus admitted. Hiccup laughed, feeling hollow. And you're still a little blue. Is something wrong? Toothus asked, out of custom more than anything else. He knew what Hiccup felt, for he felt it too. The heavy, hurtful realization of their eventual separation. Time and nature would ultimately tear them apart. Humans don't live that long. Most only about sixty or seventy year winters, provided something doesn't kill us first. I won't survive long without you. Hiccup had to smile. He leaned forward and rested his weight over crossed arms atop Toothless's head. His heel flicked into a new position as the winds changed and they continued to glide smoothly below the clouds. I thought you said your tail fin would grow back in time. Shouldn't fifty years be enough? One of the first things he had asked Toothless was if his tail still hurt. The answer was no. Toothless informed him that, while dragons could regenerate, it was a lengthy process. A down dragon would never survive long enough when it came to restoring their flight. Thanks to Hiccup, Toothless could be the exception. Toothless smiled as well, savoring the comfort of his human's weight on his back. That would be a close call, but I was not referring to my tail. The horizon began to lighten with the coming of dawn, and the sea crashed against the shore, faint but audible. Steady, thin streams of smoke were visible, just a couple of rosts ahead, no doubt rising from an assemblage of chimneys. Not quite knowing what to say, Hiccup swallowed, straightened, and laid a hand on Toothless's crown. With a breath, he said, Let's head camp here, before we get too close to that town. Together, they banged left and dropped. Hiccup always made sure to have plenty of trees for Hiccup to hide in, far enough away from civilization to avoid a surprise detection, close enough in case he needed to run into town. The boy was out of the saddle and landing on the hard dirt before Toothless's paws touched the ground. The air already tasted wintry to him, and it wouldn't be long before he'd start waking up with his moccasins covered in frost. He'd need something to cover his face soon as well, for he didn't think his nose and cheeks could handle much more abuse. So why did you get separated? Hiccup asked as he removed his harness. He was glad to be rid of it. The hard edges of his shoulder guards had begun to dig into his collarbone and hinder the mobility of his arms. Some refitting was in order. That is an important story. Hiccup could hear the hesitance, the uncertainty. He turned away from his gear. Oh? Toothless met Hiccup's eyes and said, It has to do with the war. This had Hiccup's attention. His fear of broaching the subject with Toothless was based mostly on an inability to find common ground or reason. What if, when it came down to it, they were both more loyal to their own species? What if one conversation had the power to drive them apart? He'd already given up too much to lose Toothless as well. Hiccup lowered himself to the ground, crossing his legs. His knees bounced. I was hunting with my drove. Toothless began, mindful of Hiccup's caution, to bring in the kill for the blue ones and the faded, and I traveled more south than I ever had. I suppose I was a bit arrogant at the time. We would contest over who would deliver the biggest prey or the most deadly. In the far north we have yetis and narwhals, and a whole assortment of the usual boring quarry I had taken down before. I thought that by straying only a bit I would find some new exotic creature such as a troll or a Ritchie, or a lesser dragon like a Zomok. Toothless? Hiccup interrupted with a light smile playing on his lips. You're rambling. The dragon paused, his brow lying flat over his eyes. I never used to ramble before I met you. 
Oh, fine. In my efforts to outshine my brethren, I had fallen into a trap. Hiccup sat up straighter, thinking instantly of his own contraption that had caught Toothless unawares. The dragon seemed to inhale, as though to steel himself before he continued. The only thing I remember with a clear mind is a ringing and a... a pull. From there it was like my ears and eyes had been buried in thick snow, and the only thing I knew for certain was that I had to keep her pleased. His ears fell flat against his head as he recalled the temptress that had stolen a piece of his life. She draws you into her with the most hypnotic effect, and from that moment all you will ever feel is a... is this sick... a sick alternation of fear and gratification. She? Hiccup asked with narrowed eyes. The dragon's less than cohesive explanation left him more confused. Toothless spoke in riddles with an unease that put Hiccup on edge. A demon. To the east of your old village, between other lands, she dwells within a fire rock. That was where she kept us, stored us, like laughter was waiting to be used. She has this technique, this magic, it, it enslaves us. We are at her mercy, doing her bidding, feeding her lest she eat us. To this day, I cannot understand how she could reduce the mightiest of minds into mush. At the time I had not realized, of course, but after I had escaped, now it infuriates me to no end. So you guys are being controlled? Hiccup asked in a hushed voice. That, that would change everything. Everything about the war, everything about why they fought, Hiccup jumped at his pack and began throwing out clothing and money sacks at random until he emerged with the map. Some areas were smudged from elemental abuse, but it was otherwise legible. He unrolled it across the ground before Toothless. You said it was to the east of Burke? Hiccup drew his finger from the island rightward. But equidistant from other land masses. It sounds like this thing is stationed where the North Sea and the Norwegian Sea meet. That would give it access to the most prominent Viking settlements. Was smart. Hiccup sat back on his heels and ran his hand through his hair. A dragon would rather be taken down by a human than have a human hunt for him, Toothless groused. She humiliated us without us ever realizing. Toothless bunkered down on the ground, front paws to Hiccup's knees, not even thinking to warm it at first as he usually did. Hiccup could tell the dragon was once again stewing on this conundrum, turning it over and over within his mind. It was a look on his face he had worn several times before, but until now Hiccup hadn't been clued into his thought process. As he watched Toothless's claws unconsciously gouge into the dirt, it struck Hiccup how powerfully this entire ordeal had plagued Toothless's mind from the very first meeting. Knowing Toothless as he did, Hiccup feared the dragon would find fault in himself and blame the capture and continued oppression to his own mental weakness. Why couldn't you just fly out of range? Hiccup asked, trying to make sense of it all. Would she come after you? Toothless snorted at the idea of her moving from her roost. She would have those of weaker minds come after you. Not that anyone made it so far. She kept you from leaving her reach. She had specific areas under her control, certain human villages where we alternate between for feeding. Once she was in your mind, there was no thought of escape. You hardly even know something was wrong until you were out of it. Toothless locked eyes with Hiccup, and the boy could have sworn he felt the gratitude Toothless was trying to convey. Hiccup, when you hit me with that weapon, you knocked me out of her range, before she or I could do anything. One minute it was a routine night, and suddenly, well, it hurt, but reality hit me harder. And so abruptly. But I was there, I was still free, and that is all that matters. I... I would have given up my tail for just for that. Hiccup bit his lip and found it difficult to continue to hold Toothless's intense stare. He didn't know what to say, how to respond. He couldn't suddenly stop feeling guilty because Toothless found the loss worth his freedom. Hiccup's need to fit in may have led him to Toothless, and it may have freed himself from a life of constraint on an island that would never accept him, but he could never, would never, feel justified in taking Toothless's independent flight from him. So this war is really at the hands of a demon, Hiccup forced himself to continue. It's kill or be killed on both sides. The humans are the victims, and the dragons are the tools. 
We really don't need to be fighting each other. He finally met Toothless's gaze. If she were gone, then the dragons... Would move on, I imagine. Probably back to their own nests. Like me, most of the dragons were caught like flies in a web. It is a web we cannot see and cannot fight. What started out as only a couple nests worth of dragons has grown into an army of hundreds of slaves. And the more we feed her, the more power she gains, and the cycle will persevere. This is something that needs to be stopped, because it will only worsen with time. Who knows how long this has been going on, and who knows how long it's going to take before it's more than just Vikings being targeted. And you think we're the ones who should break the cycle? Hiccup asked, his voice dropping an octave. Toothless answered with a slow nod. Given the circumstances, I would say we're the only ones who know what is really going on. We might be the only ones who can stop it. Hiccup rubbed his hand across the back of his neck and turned his face upwards. Lengthy bangs fell across his eyes. He squeezed them shut at the implications. I... I don't think I'm ready to go back. I know you are not. Hiccup smiled, thankful for Toothless's unwavering support. Of course, he suspected that Toothless had his own reservations, that he was still trying to come to terms with his enslavement before he could ever face the demon again. I think we're both entitled to be a little selfish right now, Hiccup said, falling forward out of his kneel and collapsing on the ground next to the dragon. He turned, stared up at the rapidly lightening, pink-streaked sky, and suddenly found a new sort of optimism within himself. But maybe some day, when we're ready, we'll go back and save everyone. Yes, because we've always wanted to be heroes, Toothless said with his ever-growing sarcasm. He rested his head on his crossed paws and watched his human. He kept nudged the dragon's shoulder with his fist. If you think about it, we did at one point. We both seemed to go out of our way to show off. Yeah, and if you think about it, it didn't turn out quite right for either of us, did it? That hero business is more trouble than it's worth, in my opinion. I'll say, Hiccup cheered, feeling much lighter than he had a moment ago. We can be unheroes. We'll save them when we're good and ready. Hear, hear. The cheer came beneath a small roar of approval. I'll have to get some meat, so we can start making toasts at moments like these. Toothless seemed to smile in his gaze, and he flicked his tail around so that it fell onto Hiccup's face. The boy batted it off, chuckling. Right. Enough with the serious, heavy stuff. I want to know, right now, what you humans are thinking when you desecrate meats by rubbing grains and plants in them, and then burn them. And why, for the love of all that is winked and scaled, do you catch something and then not eat it? It's no wonder you're getting raided for your food when you stick it up on display out in the open, where anyone could snatch it. Okay, okay, Hiccup yelped as Toothless prodded his side with a claw. First of all, it's called seasoning and cooking. We have a very snobbish sense of taste, okay? Things have to taste good. Besides, cooking meat makes it easier to eat. How can it be easier to eat if it's tough and tasteless? You burn out all the blood when you cook it. Oh, please, you see these? Hiccup sat up and briefly pulled the corners of his mouth apart to show two rows of blunted teeth. These are my weak little human teeth. Meats need to be tender for me to chew it, and that's what cooking does. Ridiculous. Let me see those again. Hiccup complied, feeling foolish but enthused with the silly conversation. It was uplifting and exactly what he needed after having the war bomb dropped on him. Now wasn't the time for making life or death decisions or worrying about who would outlive the other. Now was the time to enjoy his youth with his best friend. Toothless moved his face inches from Hiccup's as he observed the teeth. I've never seen human teeth this close up before. That's cause we don't have hack with them like you do. I thought they would at least be sharper in the back. It is a miracle you can eat anything at all. Toothless continued as his voice betrayed his honest wonder. They're like little ivory blocks all lined up. How quaint. Hiccup closed his mouth and scowled. They're good for crunching and smiling without terrifying people. I am terrified when you smile. Usually it precedes you doing something stupid. In response, Hiccup smiled, big and wide, with eyes that spoke of guile. Toothless's ears lowered an inch. What? Hiccup launched himself at the dragon, springing onto his back and wrapping his arms around Toothless's neck in some kind of a chokehold. 
It wasn't easy, seeing how one hand could only just grasp the other wrist over the girth of it, and the immediate thrashing Tusis began made hanging on even harder. Is this stupid yet? Hiccup laughed, locking his knees tightly behind the joints of Toothless's forelegs to secure his place against the bucking. Just about, Toothless retorted, mindful not to accidentally knock his rider against a tree. Not too hard, anyway. But you can't hang on too much longer before I throw you off. Maybe I won't have to. Toothless could feel sharp, dexterous fingers scratching around the bone of his jaw whenever they weren't desperately trying to keep Hiccup's weight on him. Oh, no, you don't. Hiccup twisted so fast within Hiccup's hold, the boy could ponder over it for years to come and successfully escape the leg lock. Within that same quick and fluid motion, the dragon managed to snag the side of Hiccup's shirt with his teeth and jerked his head to the side. Hiccup was yanked from Toothless's neck, the momentum propelling his back into the solid dirt. <clears throat> Hiccup gasped as the wind was knocked from him. He didn't have the breath to cry out as a gummy, dark maw clamped over the sides of his head. Saliva dampened his hair, and even with a blotted vision, Hiccup knew his head was currently in a dragon's mouth. Hiccup shoved a Toothless's snout as he heard, I'll just beat your head off. I win. Toothless thought the cease in Hiccup's struggles was a clear sign of submission, and began to count another triumph to his favor. That is, until he felt familiar nails scratch under his chin, and he blacked out into bliss. Moments later his bearings returned to him, and Toothless found himself blinking his eyes to the sight of Hiccup rubbing his sleeves over the soggiest part of his hair. That was gross, Hiccup grumbled when he noticed Toothless looking at him. That was cheap. My hat smells like fish. Your hat tastes like victory. You were already dead, so what you did does not count. What if someone happened to walk by and saw you with my head in your mouth? You'd be attacked on the spot. You just don't want me to do that again. You know I'm going to, especially considering how much you do not seem to like it. Ah, oh, you ripped my tunic, Hiccup continued with a deaf ear turned towards his friend. He stuck his hand through the tear down the seam. Look at this. Looks better, I think. Hiccup pursed his lips, then sighed. Ah, oh, well, I was planning on running into town anyway. Might as well stock up for the long haul while I can still somewhat communicate. I'll add a new tunic to the list. And new shoes, Toothless supplied. Did you not say they were hurting your feet? Hmm, yeah, Hiccup said thoughtfully as he glanced down at his feet. His toes had been cramped for a while now, and he had stretched the leather as far as it would go. Already the soles were pulling back from broken stitching. Well, looks like it's light enough out to pop in. Won't I be aside? He went to his bag and pulled out the beige cloak, throwing it over his shoulders, and then tied a money pouch to his belt. How well are my English sounding? Hiccup said in the language. I've been practicing. I've told you, I cannot hear a different language. But you sound much less intelligent, if that helps. Hiccup gave him a flat stare. Thanks, I must be doing something right. See you in a few. And try to stay out of trouble. Toothless watched as Hiccup plodded off into the woods, still rubbing at his hair. No promises, and remember to bring me back some fish. No promises.